And we're back with a quick tutorial on temperature management. I don't refer to it as just cooling because it's it's a far larger topic than that, but we don't have a lot of time, so let's compress through this as quickly as possible. Firstly, why do you want cooling in the first place at the start of the game? One reason and one reason alone, and that is to keep your crops alive. Your crops will stifle if the temperature goes above 30 C. This is the only reason you want cooling in the early game. Your duplicates are really, really, really hardy. And when I say really hardy, I mean... What I've done here is, let's just grab two kilos of oxygen, this is debug mode, and we are going to fill the entire map with it. And if you'll notice, that oxygen has been set to 60C, so this is 60C oxygen that has now been just dumped throughout the entire base. <laughs> Oops. Now, as you can see, the plants have stifled for a bit, but in general they're going to recover. It takes a while to overpower all the heat that's being dumped in. Uh, the plants have quickly recovered. So what we're going to do is fill the base a few more times with 60 degree oxygen until eventually it stops recovering quite so quickly. Yeah, that looks that looks like it would be uncomfortable. Now, as you can see, all these plants here have stifled. Namely because they've been exposed to, well, too much temperature. Simplest thing to do? Ice machines. Now, ice machines are... Hmm, ice machines are hmm, a half measure. The reason being, while they do delete some heat in their action, what they do is they take in water, they freeze the water down until it's minus 20 C, and then if you use that ice for cooling, you effectively get slightly more cooling than the machine gives off, because the machine does give off an awful lot of heat. If you look at it here, it's, it's pretty toasty. So what normally what you can do is you can just keep running these constantly, churning out ice, dumping the ice into your water supply, and then feeding them back into the machines, and if you really want to invest that much time and energy, you'll get the cooling of about... I don't even believe it has the cooling of a wheezewort. It's... it's not really that good. Best thing to do with them, create a bunch of ice, and then when you encounter a problem where, oh no, oh no, oh no, I have, uh, well, a whole bunch of, you know what, we'll do this slightly differently. There we go, much better. Now what we're going to do is, because we've got a whole bunch of, well, stifled plants, we're just going to go into utilities, grab a temperature shift plate, and make that temperature shift plate out of ice, because we've created enough ice that we can do that. Just chuck it somewhere in the middle, and let the duplicates come along and build that. And there we go, the temperature shift plate start starts. Now I've just put a little bit of a lip on each end just to try and keep the, the liquid in. I should realistically put in an awful lot more insulated tiles to keep all the temperature trapped in here. But if we just check on the temperature overlay here, you'll see, yeah, things in here have got really, really, really chilly really easily. That's what's, That's the power of having the ability to move heat around. Think of ice machines as the ability to move heat from one location to another. They don't create heat, they don't destroy heat. Well, okay, technically they destroy it a little bit, but think of them more as the ability to dump a whole bunch of heat into one area and take that cooling and dump it into a nice localized area that should need it. Namely, this place. Now, once we deconstruct that, that water can flow down to the next level and we can get some more cooling on the lower levels. Uh, as you see, the mealwood tiles here have all got dropped down to, what, 20 degrees or so in temperature? This is just a really simple, quick, and efficient way to get yourself to, well, to keep your crops alive when the time comes. Uh, also, you can mop it up. And another thing, just make sure when you do mop it up, you don't have anything that's going to try and uh, pick them up and bottle them up. As in, you should probably turn off your water cooler at this point as well, and leave all the water sitting there. Because while it's sitting there in those bottles, it will keep jumping a chill into the surrounding area, and that should save all your crops. This is the only cooling you should ever need in the early game, and that is only because you want to keep your crops alive, to keep your duplicates fed. That is it. An alternative to cooling down your crops to keep them alive is just to switch over to hatches or pips. They can survive up to 70C, at which point you don't have to worry about really cooling your base at all until you get into the more power or heat producing machines. And by that, I mean, here is some of the more heat, more annoying heat producers and some of the ones you won't care about so much. There's a rusty oxidizer and an electrolyzer. They'll produce oxygen uh, at 70C, which is a little bit painful, but as you've noted before, when we dumped a bunch of hot oxygen into this base, it didn't really do much. So what I can do here is just dump in a bunch of hot oxygen, turn on the temperature overlay, and just keep dumping it in. You'll notice the base keeps recovering from it. The reason being the tiles, there's an enormous amount of mass in them, and they keep soaking up the heat. So, theoretically, you can keep dumping in quite hot oxygen quite for quite a long period of time before it will become problematic. Your duplicates don't care about temperatures up to... Well, they start getting scalded about 72 C. And if you let them run around in liquids at uh, temperatures of about 60 C or above, there's the possibility of them getting heat stroke. I'm not sure of the exact mechanics of heat stroke, but honestly, if your base is going above 60 C, you've probably made a mistake somewhere along the line. Anyway, even with all that heat injection, you notice the duplicates are getting along just fine. The only downside is a whole bunch of mirth leaf got stifled. But all the critters are still alive, food production is still ongoing, and everything is still fu functioning along as normal. 
So don't worry too much about dumping in 70C oxygen and 70C rust. Just make sure you have some crops that can handle it or some food source that can handle it and you should be okay. The coal generator and the wood burner, they kick out carbon dioxide at about 110C. The coal generator is probably the best of them because it produces so little carbon dioxide and as long as you put a carbon skimmer at the bottom of your base, say down somewhere near the bottom, that will skim out all the excess carbon dioxide and you won't have to worry too much. But all of these here, these machines here, these ones are all dangerous, every single last one of them. The petroleum generator and the natural gas generator both kick out carbon dioxide at 110C, but they also kick out polluted water at 40C. That's fine, but the problem is, once these buildings are hotter than 40C, the water they kick out gets hotter as well. So if they go up to, say, 45C, then you're going to get 45C polluted water, and it usually results in a feedback loop. You're going to want to have cooling available before you start running these in general, or have you know at least a cold biome to stick them in. All of these machines up here generate enormous amounts of heat, uh, the oil refinery you shouldn't even go near until you have atmosuits suits because it gives off natural gas and that will cause problems because your duplicates can't breathe it. But all the rest of these, they produce quite a lot of heat and you really should have a cooling solution in place before you start playing with them. The main culprit is the metal refinery. This is the gatekeeper to mid-game. If you cannot deal with the heat that this gives off, you're in trouble. So that's the first thing we're going to start with. This here is the simplest way to dispose of the heat from a metal refinery. It's also very beneficial. The heat from the refinery is given out by... it takes in coolant basically, in this instance petroleum, that petroleum then gets spit out once it's been used to provide cooling for some metal that's been heated up, and then it comes sense around and get back into the machine. What we're doing is dumping the heat though into this water. That water will turn to steam, that steam will get fed into the steam turbine. This is the basis of all heat deletion in the entire game pretty much. Well, all decent heat deletion. So let's fast forward it here and have a quick look. And there we go, we can see the liquid going out, it's coming out at 122. It's coming back in at, well, 80, 90. It will, after a few runs of this, it will cause this water to flash to steam. This allows you to refine as much metal as you want. Well, theoretically, there is a catch. Steam turbines take in steam, destroy it, well, turn it into 95C water, which is dumped back into the system. If you put in water, the hotter the steam that goes in, the more power that comes out, up until about 200C. Anything above 200C is just wasted. You don't get any more excess power. These things can go up to about 850 watts. However, there's one mechanic that's not quite so obvious. 10% of all the heat that is consumed by the steam turbine is given off by the steam turbine as heat at the, at the top. If you see heat production there at the top, it's 34.94 kilodTUs, and that fluctuates up and down depending on the amount of heat the steam turbine is destroying. So the more the steam, steam turbine works, the hotter it gets. And the steam turbine has a sort of overheat function. Once it hits 100C, it will stop functioning. Now. Uh, you might not be familiar with all the heat values that come out of all the machines in the game, but this is in an, dealing with 41.68, that's kid of DTUs, that, that's like two plastic presses in one spot. It's an enormous amount of heat, which brings us to our next key in cooling, and that is the aqua tuner. Here we have a thermo aqua tuner. Now, you may have also heard of uh, about the thermal regulator. Ignore that one. It's about half as powerful. It has its uses, but by and large, you're better off using the thermal aqua tuner. It just provides more cooling for the same cost, same power, and it takes up less space. But it doesn't really provide cooling. All it does is it moves heat around. As in, water goes in one side, it comes out the other side 14 degrees cooler. Well, any liquid, but we're going to use water. There'll be reasons for that later. However, that water that came out 14 degrees cooler, the heat f that was removed from it has to go somewhere, and that somewhere is the aqua tuner itself. The aqua tuner then dumps that heat into its surrounding environment. So what we've got here is a liquid pump, uh, a thermo aqua tuner, and in this liquid pile we have 44 degree water, in this liquid pile we have 30 degree water, and what we're going to do is we're going to pump all of this water through the aqua tuner and out the other side. And if we're right, this should come out at 30 C, the opposite side, this water here, this water here, which is 30 degrees inside the thermal aqua tuner, will start soaking up the heat from the water passing through it. So the water in the middle should stop being 30 degrees and end up being 44 degrees by the time it's finished processing all of this water. Well, that's the theory. I've never actually tested this, but this is how it should work in practice. This water will dump 14 degrees of its temperature into this, and since they're both the exact same amount of water, that means this water in here should end up 14 times, well, 14 C hotter than when we started. This water here should end up 14 C cooler than when we started. So let's fast forward a bit and see what happens. Uh, so far, yeah, we're looking at 30 C water on this side. And we're down to the last few hundred kilos of water here. This side is looking 30 C exactly as it should be. Other side is gone. And now in the center, we're looking at 43.7 C. 
Okay, so a little bit of heat vanished there. This should be 44, but I think that might be because I put the Equituner in at the end. I should have preheated the Equituner to 30C. Okay, my bad. But as you can see here, the Equituner does not delete heat. It does not create heat. All it does is moves heat from move heat from one point to the other. This 44 degree water is now 30 degrees, and the water that it was in that was 30 degrees is now 44 degrees. That's all the Equituner does. But combining this ability with the steam turbine, you can create real cooling. Here we are back at our original metal refinery heat deletion device. Now there's been a few additions, but what has remained the same is the petroleum is still being routed through here through the steam turbine, but we've added in an aqua tuner. Now I'll go through this in a little bit more detail later, but the point being this aqua tuner is running a cooling loop that goes around here and cools down the oxygen up here in the steam turbine area. This is to stop the steam turbine from overheating. As you can see, the steam turbine's at 86, 87 C, ooh, 88. Yeah, the temperature around it is pretty hot. The reason for that is, well, yeah, we don't have a lot of oxygen in there. How much is it? Yeah, it should be really two kilos of oxygen pressure. One second. Yeah, there we go. It's now almost 100 C. Yeah, I really should expand the cooling loop, so I should have tested some of this. We'll be doing a lot of, I'm showing you a lot of samples, just real life samples from survival bases, just to show you all the different types that can be made. But by and large, you want to keep your steam turbine below 100 C or it's going to stop working. So let's make a minor adjustment to this cooling loop. There we go, much better. I put the cooling loop behind the uh, steam turbine and that's cooling it down an awful lot more efficiently. Oh, yeah, sorry about that dupe. Now, um, this is the basis of pretty much all sorts of cooling design. You have the thermo aqua tuner down at the base of the steam turbine and that provides cooling and it also provides cooling for the steam turbine. So you're going to lose about 10% of the cooling potential of your thermo aqua tuner just to keep the steam turbine uh, cool. However, there's a really good benefit to this as well. As the aqua tuner runs, it generates heat, which is fed into the steam turbine, which generates energy, which means about 40% of the run cost of the aqua tuner is covered by the steam turbine paying for it itself. Now you have to do a few things with the power wires to get that to work quite well, but we'll cover all of that later as well, hopefully, if we have time. Uh, but that brings us to the most important section is why we always use polluted water, or you see people use polluted water for most of their cooling loops, instead of using, say, petroleum or ethanol. This is the same experiment as before, except this time we've dumped in ethanol in here. So the ethanol is getting dumped through the aqua tuner. It started at 44, and it should... Oh, one second. Sorry about that, trying to run too many things at once. So this started off at 44. We're going to dump it across to the other side. So if this was water, this uh, liquid in here should, have end, should end up at 44C because it started at 30. However, it's not going to. The reason is to do with... Therm uh, no, specific heat capacity. It's how much temperature you can dump into something before it changes temperature by one degree. That's what that number refers to. All you need, really need to know is water and polluted water are the highest you're going to get early game. 4.179. That's an enormous amount of heat capacity. Ethanol, on the other hand, only has about 2.460. So even though all of this has been dumped through an aqua tuner and has dumped 14 degrees of its heat out of it, it's only raised the temperature of the water in here to 38.2. It's almost six degrees short. So because it has less thermal capacity, running it through an aqua tuner generates less temperature differential. You can't generate as much heat or you can't generate as much cooling, whatever way you want to look at it. That's why everyone prefers to use water. Same with petroleum, it's even weaker at 1.760 and crude oil is even weaker at 1.690. Now the reason everyone prefers to use polluted water, despite its annoying tendency to off gas, is it has a freezing point of minus 20. Regular water has a freezing point of minus zero, well, zero degrees, basically. Also, as well as that, the vaporization point of polluted water is a bit hotter. So you've got 20 degrees of extra leeway on both sides of polluted water, which makes it really good as a coolant. Well, that combined with its high specific heat capacity makes it really good as a coolant. And this is also, the, this stat is the main reason everyone loves super coolant as well. Super coolant has a whopping heat capacity of 8.44. That means it's got twice the heat capacity of uh, polluted water or water. And as well as that, if you feed that into a steam turbine, the amount of heat given off will pay about 80% of the costs of running the aqua tuner in the first place, which means combining a super coolant with an aqua tuner under a steam turbine is, is it's not quite a free way of generating cooling, but it's a, it's a pretty cheap way of generating cooling. Here is a relatively normal steam turbine heat deletion device. I'll show you some proper examples after this, but this is just one I threw together really quickly. What this is doing here is, this aqua tuner here is running some polluted water. This polluted water is going around and cooling down the steam turbine, but at the same time it comes down here and cools down this box. We have a, a pipe sensor here that's detecting what temperature the water is as it passes through, and if it's above one degree, then it tells the aqua tuner to turn on and cool that water down further. And that's polluted water going through the pipe, so if it goes down to minus, you know, 
14 or 15 degrees, we don't care. It won't freeze or jam or cause any issues. Now, the aqua tuner is made of steel because it needs to be made of steel. Otherwise, it will overheat. This is one of the reasons steam is or steel is so valuable. You could use gold amalgam in some instances. It does. It, these aqua tuners can uh, take quite a bit of heat, even as if they are gold amalgam. The problem with that is uh, gold amalgam is a terrible conductor, and you have to do some tricks to get them to work right. I prefer to just go a full measure and get steel. Steel you can get your hands on quite easily, so long as you can work a metal refinery, which yeah, we've kind of covered already, but you're going to need a you will have to worry about the heat deletion from that at the start. Usually, you uh, to make your first batches of steel, you take some a wild environment, some biome, and you dump a bunch of heat into it, preferably into its water supply, just to get enough for 1.2 tons of steel. Another way to get the steel is to go to the top of the map, find the Veritas building, and dismantle some of the steel things there for their steel. Now, this is what we're using to generate an ice box. So as the water goes around, it keeps generating cooling and that cooling keeps coming back in here and dumping its chill into this box this box is getting colder and colder and then what we have here is we're going to cool down cool down a whole bunch of ox cool down a whole bunch of oxygen what we've got in here is just a this device is set to keep the temperature in here at 22 degrees if the temperature in here goes above 22 degrees it will close this door this is a steel door that steel door will allow temperature to flow from this side to the other and since we have a cold spot over here of 7c well eventually it should go down to one that will allow the temperature to flow across and keep this area at a nice constant cool temperature. And now what we're going to do is we're going to dump oxygen through it. Right here you'll see this is a full Rodriguez. It's doing 3 kilos of oxygen per second or 2.975, whatever it is. We're going to reroute all the oxygen so it's going through this area. And there we go. So this oxygen is coming out at 68C. And now we're going to pipe it through. Now we've only got three pipe segments here to work with because I made this rather small. But I made them out of aluminum ore, aluminum ore. If you look up its thermal conductivity, this is the most important thing when you're making radiant anything, is thermal conductivity. For example, this is aluminum ore that aluminum that is making these pipes, and it gives it a thermal conductivity of 410, which is ridiculous. Gold, copper, everything else doesn't even come close. They're about 60 or so. And when it comes to radiant pipes, aluminum is the second best. If you want to make the absolute best, use steel. Now, steel, of course, is incredibly difficult to get your hands on, but it has a thermal conductivity of 108. So now what we can do is just check, as this uh, goes through at 68C, it comes out the other side at 22. Oh, just look at that. Perfectly temperature-controlled oxygen popping out the other side. No problems at all. And the way we're able to do this is with this door. This is what we call a thermal injector. A thermal injector is a steel door. It's always going to be a steel door because steel is the best and it has the, the highest range of temperatures it can survive in. Every time, you just have, hook it up to a temperature sensor. Every time that door engages, it sucks heat across the divide. And then what you want to do is create either an ice box or a hot box, depending on what you're trying to do with temperature. This just allows you to dump temperature across. This is probably the most important mm, concept to grasp when dealing with temperature or trying to regulate temperature specifically. If you want to do a sleep wheat farm, something like this, also very handy. The ability to control precisely how hot, how hot or cold something is, well, to quite a good degree of accuracy. The flexibility this gives you is you can crank up the temperature if you want and set it to 30C, or you can crank it down even further to make it 10C. You can change the temperature to whatever you like. This is only three kilos of oxygen, and a steam t and a, an aqua tuner can eat that much heat for breakfast. Not a bother. So three kilos of oxygen versus one of these, and it would really demolish it. Now, a quick thing on efficiency for these things, because hmm, there is quite a way to save yourself a little bit of power. Normally what you do is you hook it into your main power grid, and then what I like to do is I like to hook all of it into one single con uh, one single contiguous conductive wire. Energy draw on that is about 1.32 kilowatts. Then all you do is you hook up a power shutoff and a battery. The battery is set here to, keep, to activate this power shutoff between 30 and 40%. What that does at that point is it connects you onto this main grid up here and draws power until the battery is at 40%. However, until once the battery hits 40%, it disconnects you from the grid, and that way the steam turbine's power, any power it generates, either gets stored in the battery for use by the aqua tuner, or if we're connected up to the main grid, it can also get deaths dumped on there. This just allows you to recycle the power. There's other ways, but this is just a very simple way of doing it. Uh, do not hook up the shutoff to your power transformers. Every time you use a power, uh, you shut off a, a power transformer with automation, all the charge in it is lost. And if you're doing it frequently, like these type of designs you usually are, you lose the charge multiple times a, 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 a cycle, and that will cause you issues. Now, let's have a look at some real-world examples. Don't panic too much. This is fairly straightforward. It's just a case of explaining what's going on. It covers all the mechanics we've used so far. Nothing new here. First off, you've got your metal refineries here. They go up and they go through here. They dump their heat into this thin band of liquid. Now, 
I didn't really cover this very well earlier, but you want to put a awful lot of, of water in here. And you'll notice here that each tile is about a over 100 kilos of steam. The reason for that is as the liquid passes through, it has a lot of mass to dump its heat into, and it just ensures that you don't get any overheats on your petroleum going through. You, normally I use petroleum in these things. You could get away with crude oil, but that's cutting it a little bit fine, and it might, it just petroleum safer. Use it if you can. So that's the exact same mechanic we've covered already. Right over here we have the aqua tuner, and the aqua tuner is only doing something slightly different. What we're using here is a very optimized uh, cooling solution. Now all you need to worry about is this little bit here, these little this little water going round and round in circles. What's happening is here I've made an ice box, and this ice box is set up with the temperature sensor set to minus one. What happens is this liquid pump in here pumps the water into the aqua tuner if the temperature in here ever goes above minus one. That goes to the aqua tuner, gets spit back into the tank and dumped out that liquid vent, and just round and round it goes. That allows it, that's and this is the ice box. This is the ice box cooling. The only difference is it doesn't have the steam turbine mounted on top like you normally see. It's just slightly off to the side. There's plenty of variants like this. Then what happens is there's just a, a cooling loop coming through here. It's passing through the edges of this ice box, which is all surrounded in gold metallic tiles for that good thermal, in, thermal conductivity. And then that just rotates all the way around this room and dumps chill into it to keep all these steam turbines nice and cool. Now you'll notice I didn't use uh, radiant piping the whole way along. Uh, the reason for that is I think when I installed this first, uh, I didn't really have enough gold to pay for all the radiant piping, and I never bothered fixing it in the end because I didn't need that much cooling. So yeah, this keeps all the steam turbines cool, and this allows all my metal refineries to run flat out 100% with no cost. And when I say no cost, I mean when you refine metal with these and you dump it in here, the heat generated generates power. That power gets stored up in the battery boxes. Though, yeah, these things are all going to be out of date in the current patch, so ignore the battery boxes. But as long as you have enough batteries to store the power, usually when you're doing steel and iron, the metal refineries produce enough heat that when it goes through the steam turbine and generates power, it actually pays for the cost of running the metal refineries themselves. So the only power costs you're paying are when you refine gold, copper, aluminum, and that's pretty much it. And copper is not too bad. It pays for quite a chunk of itself as well. Gold is probably the worst. Now, then we have a third loop right over here. This third loop is going also through the icebox, and that's cooling down the whole power supply area. So you notice these uh, petroleum generators, all at 20 degrees. They have no problems. They are nice and chill. Everything's fine. None of them have gone above the 40 degree mark where their water would, or their output would start getting too hot. This just means I can keep these all nice, cool, self-contained. And as well as that, if we check the power overlay, you should see the whole thing is plugged into a main power spine. So the whole thing, not a bother on it. Works just fine. Power supply is right beside the cooling and everything. So this one aqua tuner is providing cooling for all of these metal refineries, all of these steam turbines, all of this power supply. And we have another cooling loop going through here through the center of this that provides cooling so that the plastic presses, the kilns and the rock crushers don't overheat either. While simultaneously providing a little bit of a decor buff. This is just one aqua tuner. That's how much cooling they produce. They're absolutely brilliant. So just combine a combine an aqua tuner with a steam tube and you'll be sorted. Now, a couple more examples. Now, this is another example of cooling. Well, okay, you're going to say it's not an example of cooling, but uh, I beg to differ. It's the exact same mechanics in play as before. We're using a thermal injector here. We're just using it in reverse to dump heat from magma into petroleum, or well, into crude oil so that we can turn it into petroleum. So what's happening here is this door is just detecting when the temperature here goes below 403. When it does, it closes this door, and then the temperature from this magma gets injected in. See? There it is, it's dumping temperature across. This mechanic, same everywhere. It's the exact same mechanic, it's just reversed. So that's why I'm saying that the thermal injectors are a very important mechanic. You can use them both directions. You can use them to transfer cold across or heat, whichever you're looking for. I mean, heat, it's just energy or lack of energy that you're transferring. Anyway. Uh, next up. Great. Both of my uh, steam vents are dormant on this map, so yeah, let's just have a quick go over here. This is steam turbine, aqua tuner, same thing exactly again, and a tiny ice box. I mean, it's this, it's all the same things ex except just a different size, different shape, or something along those lines. We're just running a cooling loop through here. That cooling loop cools down the ice box. That ice box then injects cooling through a therm thermal injector into this to keep everything here below 95C, and that just causes the steam to condense. So uh, what I'm trying to get across here is aqua tuner, steam turbine, as much cooling as you could possibly want. One of these can do an enormous amount of cooling. How much cooling, though? So now we're getting to the ludicrous end of cooling. In this we have a super coolant 
powered aqua tutor as in there's super coolant going through it and there even have a, a pool of liquid super coolant down here storing up some chill it's down as low as minus 221 this is providing chilling to this box this box is providing chilling to uh, a floor we'll, we'll cover that in a moment however one interesting variant on this is by chilling this box and leaving some diamond tiles here this allows us to inject cooling in here so if you'll notice, there's no active cooling source for the steam turbine. The cooling is all coming through this diamond window temperature shift plate, getting injected into the room. This is only really possible, though, because this is quite chilly. It's minus 55 C, and there's a fair bit of oxygen pressure in there at 20 kilos. But what is this actually cooling? This rotates up here, goes up to the top of the map, and it rotates all the way across the top here. And as you'll see, there is meteors in inbound, and as the meteors are coming down, they're giving off carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide is passing the liquid supercoolant in the pipes, and that liquid supercoolant is causing the carbon dioxide to, well, turn to liquid, or in some cases just turn straight into solid chunks. That's how much cooling is possible with a, a one aqua tuner. It's chilling down all of this to produce an enormous amount of carbon dioxide, which can be later harvested for feeding slickers or whatever you want to do. I think it was, was this generated. I think it's a couple of kilos of carbon dioxide a second on average. That's the kind of ridiculous stuff you can get up to with aqua tuners, one steam turbine, and some super coolant. And there, yeah, there's another one over this side as well. However, that's not the only way to do cooling. There are other options when it comes to cooling things down. Instead of just throwing brute force and power at it, there are a few slightly more exotic ideas you can go with. Now, this is the same good old uh, cooling loop going on with the refineries. They're dumping their heat out, but you'll notice they're dumping their heat out directly into the room instead of into a specific... Mm, compartment. The reason for that is this is a hot industrial brick. It's more of a case of instead of cooling anything down, you let it all overheat. The metal refineries are made of ceramic, so they overheat at 275. Everything else is made of steel, so it overheats at 275. And you just let the heat off gas into the room. This gets fed into steam turbines up the top, and this just results in the whole thing. Any heat that's given off by your natural gas generators, your petroleum generators, all of that is just turned into steam. That steam is eaten by the steam turbines. And with a little bit of automation, you can keep a, a fairly level yeah. gas pressure going on in here. Downsides are this costs an enormous amount of steel and you're probably going to need to dump in tons and tons of granite temperature shift plates. But it's just an example of what you can achieve if you want to in this game. It gives you all the options. There's there's so many different ways of uh, applying cooling. Another op I mean, there's just one aqua tuner here and its only purpose currently is to cool down these steam turbines. However, what you could do, and what some people like to do, is they'll grab their aqua tuner and they'll place it somewhere up near the edge of the map near space, and then what you can do is you can pour useless materials on it, say uh, phosphorus or something, phosphorite or something like that. That will heat up and eventually it will turn into gas, at which point it will radiate out into space and vanish. So you can dump heat that way. You can tr throw waste material, say carbon dioxide, at your aqua tuner, let the carbon dioxide soak up a bunch of heat, and then dump that heat into space to be sucked away into the void. There are so many options. Now, I'm going to include the test map on this so you can have a look through some of the basic designs. This is probably the most important example. This one allows you to refine metal and get your hands on lots of steel, and steel is probably the most valuable material in the game until you get to space. Uh, so keep an eye on this example, and also this example over here allows you to pretty much apply cooling to anything you want. It doesn't have to be oxygen. You could apply it to your water supply in your base, to your crops, anything you want. This sort of design will work for all of them. So between those two designs, you can handle 99% of your power, your cooling needs. Uh, this tutorial has went way over length. Uh, apologies for that, but there's just there is so many options when it comes to cooling and so many different variants and ways you can do it. Uh, there are other cooling methods you can use that don't re require an aqua tuner and a steam turbine, but they're all pretty much inferior. The reason being the aqua tuner provides so much cooling and the fact that you can recycle a bunch of the heat to get some of the power costs back just make it incredibly useful. Learn to use them, learn to love them, and... Just make sure you get your hands on enough steel. Once you have, you can you can freeze the map if you want. Anyway, I hope this was at least mildly informative to, for you. Save game is attached, and uh, good luck.